Okay, folks. So let's uh, let's make a start. So if we could have our phones uh, off. Yeah. Well. Hello. Okay, Hello. folks. Yeah. So we're going to go on with this wonderful letter of Peter that, as I say, he wrote to all those thousands of people that he baptized on the day of Pentecost. And they were Orthodox Jews who were wealthy. They'd retired to live in Jerusalem. And well, they've become Christians. They got persecuted. And they've now fled and they're in exile in what we would call Turkey. And so they're starting to sort of lose their faith and get a bit tired of the race. And so he's writing to them to encourage them and to stir them up. So let's start with, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we come to your word. And we come to your son, the Lord Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you will, you will teach us of your ways and that you will open our hearts and open our minds to your word and to get it and to see that these things are wonderfully true and that the Lord Jesus is real and that you are real and your eternal kingdom is real and that your word is truly your word to us and that we might believe that with all our heart, soul and mind and go your way, sinners and weak that we are, to the glory of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, for as much then as Christ suffered in the flesh, Paul, uh, Peter says, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. Now that is an incredible challenge. He's saying, think of Jesus dying on the cross and you are to have the same mind that he had there, as he hung there. Wow. Now Paul says the same in Philippians 2. He says, let this mind be in you. That was also in Christ Jesus. In the context, he's talking about Jesus when he was dying on the cross. So what he's saying is, you are to aim to have the same mind, the same kind of thought pattern that the Lord Jesus had as he was hanging on the cross. Well, the height of the calling is huge. Of course, we will not get there totally. But that is the aim. And that is an ambition that actually defines you as a Christian, that I want to think like him. And, of course, that, that is what it is, to, to think as him. And the heart in the Bible, as I was telling you yesterday, is really the mind or the spirit. So when we're given the promise of God's Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Christ, it's all, in my opinion, the same thing. This is him trying to push his mind into yours. That's why Paul says, let, allow this mind to be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. Open yourself to the Spirit. Let him push his thinking, his worldview, his pair of eyes into yours. And he says, arm yourselves with the same mind. Well, again, Paul says the same in Philippians 2, where he says that you should be like-minded. Have the same mind. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So when he says you should all have the same mind, the mind that he has in view is the mind of Jesus. Okay? So that is what binds us together. For example, in my, in my case, I am committed to the principle that I will try, try, try to have the mind of Jesus, even though I fail so miserably. But I, that's what I want. I want to have his mind. And I'll meet you. And you've got the same Try, try, try. Yes, I want to think like Jesus. I want to have his thoughts, his mind in mind. Then you and me are friends. You and me are connected. We have the same mind. The mind which is Jesus. The mind of Christ. That's why Paul says, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So denominationalism and all that, they're all caught up on doctrine. and oh, what do you, How do you understand this verse? How do you understand that point? Doctrine has a tendency to divide, but what unites is that you have a common you have a relationship with Jesus. So do I. That's sort of the uh, vertical thing that from me to him, it's there. From you to him, it's there. Therefore, horizontally here, we are connected, and that is the essence. That is what makes you a Christian. That is what unites you with other people. There's no such thing as in our basis of 
you know, doctrine or whatever, oh, oh, you've got to tick all the same boxes and then we're friends. No, no, it doesn't work like that. You might even have the same intellectual positions as somebody else, but that does not make you actually one with them. What makes you one is that we've all got our common vertical connection to Jesus. So he says, Jesus died, he suffered for us in the flesh, so that, verse 2, you should no longer live the rest of your time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. So this is where the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross makes all the difference in practice. This is where the death of Jesus on the cross makes all the difference in practice. That because he died for me, I cannot be passive to that. I will no longer waste my life living the rest of my time I've got left in this world uh, to the flesh, to the lusts of men. Oh, I lust for this. Oh, I want that. Oh, I'm going to go helter-skelter for that. Oh, I want that drug. I want that car. I want that woman, that man, that relationship, that house, that bank balance, that pension. No, you will not go running for that. Why? Because he died for me. That has an absolutely massive psychological impact upon you. 4 verse 3, we have spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties and abominable idolatries. He says, look, we've wasted enough of our time. And this is the message. Hi Luke, come in mate, you're welcome. Um, we've wasted enough of our lives. This is what he's saying. We've, we've spent enough of our past lifetime, verse 3, um, doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked, that is, we lived in a way of life, of lusting, of getting drunk, reveling, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. So he's saying, look, Jesus died for you, and that has an effect upon you, that therefore I'm not going to waste my time any longer trying to please myself. Wow, he died for me. He got me forgiveness. He's got me eternal life. Therefore, I will not waste any more time as I did in the past. This is very powerful. And I notice he says, when we, Peter's saying, you and me, when we lived in lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and idolatry, Peter was a Jew. He was a Jewish fisherman who lived by the Sea of Galilee. And so, before he was called by Jesus... When he was there, he was fishing, and Jesus came up and said, Hey, drop your, drop your nets, come and follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Before that, Peter had been, as he says here, we lived a life of lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and idolatry. And he's saying, that's how I was, until Jesus called me. What I noticed there is that Jesus didn't, when he was choosing his twelve disciples, he didn't choose very pious, holy men living in Jerusalem. He goes up to Galilee, where they're pretty rough and ready and uh, not very piously religious, and where the Jewish people were doing this kind of thing. Drinking parties, drunkenness, revelries, lust, and, and so forth. And he called those rough fishermen who were doing all these things. And he also says, we lived like that. And I said at the start that these letters are written by Peter to Orthodox Jews who were very pious and holy, who had were so holy that from all around the Roman Empire they had retired to Jerusalem. And he says, we, you and me, we used to do these things. And you think, that's interesting, that Orthodox Jews did these things, drinking parties, lust, drunkenness, idolatry, I didn't think, you know, that's not what pious religious Jews are supposed to do, but they did. And so you see there that actually the hardcore life of hardcore religion in Judaism actually led them to do this. And that is the same today. You know that the Jews keep the Sabbath, right? Shabbat. From sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. Well, I, I've often gone preaching in Israel... And some years ago, uh, well, uh, uh, around the Tel Aviv bus station, that's the capital of Israel, there is the only, as far as I know, the only red light district in Israel. 
It's got these booths, sex booths, and these uh, basically whorehouses uh, just all around the back of the bus station there. Well, I flew over there actually on a Friday morning with a friend of mine from Australia who was jet lagged. And so he was bright and bushy tailed at night time and he was exhausted in the daytime, there was a big time difference. So he was bright and bushy tailed that Friday night. He said, oh, let's go out preaching. And I said, we were in the middle of Tel Aviv. I said, oh, the only place on a Friday night where there's a load of people is the red light district at the back of the bus station. I said, we can go down there and give out New Testaments if you want. But I said, it's, it's, a, it's a load of whores down there. Well, we did go there about one o'clock in the morning, and there we were, and our place was buzzing with people. It's supposed to be Friday night, it's supposed to be Shabbat, it's supposed to be Sabbath. We were giving out New Testaments and all that. And there was this woman who was clearly a prostitute, who I guess done a deal or done a thing, and um, she sort of said to me in Russian, Oh, I don't speak your language. And I said, like, and I also speak Russian, actually. And she was like taken back. And I, I said, look, you know, um, you considered Jesus Christ. And she said, I'm a whore. I said, yeah, you're a whore. But I, I mean, have you considered Jesus Christ? And she said, no, I, I'm not interested in religion. And I said, yeah, I'm not either, particularly. And she said, look here. She said, it's Friday night, right? It's uh, Sabbath. And she said, I've been working, a prostitute's work, right? Uh, I've been working this evening. And she said, all my clients are Hasidic Jews. Now, Hasidic Jews are a far-right wing Judaism, people in Judaism, who have been to the synagogue on Friday night service, and they go down the red light area. <laughs> and she said, they're the most demanding of all the clients. Well, the mind boggles. The mind boggles what exactly she meant by that. But there you go, go figure. And she said, I don't have nothing to do with religion. And I thought, yeah, I get it, that these guys go to do their, you know, these are so holy, they won't even eat a cheeseburger because it's got a milk product, that's cheese, and meat product together. And the law of Moses says, you should not uh, boil a kid, a, a, a kid of the goats in its mother's milk. That means you can't have cheeseburgers. Well, that's, been, that's bonkers. Uh, but it's very holy, I, 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 I've got to disinfect this, it was touched by a Gentile. Right? This is hardcore, you know, guys with long beards and, and all the ponytail stuff and all that stuff. And, uh, and yet after synagogue service on Friday night, they go down the red light area with Gentile Russian prostitutes. Go figure. My, this is my point, that hardcore religion, box ticking, that I have done this, I have been to church, I have maybe paid a tithe, I have done this. Oh, great, and now I'm free to do what I want. No. And you see, he says, Peter says to these one-time Orthodox Jews, he says, we, you, who were so pious that you retired from your areas where you grew up all around the Roman Empire and came to live in Jerusalem for your retirement so you could be near the temple and all that, he says, you and me, Peter, we used to live in lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and idolatry. Yeah, absolutely. I did scratch my head a bit about this verse until that night in Tel Aviv, when I got it. Ah, got it, straight and clear. The, 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 the more you're into this religious stuff, the more likely you are to not be a spiritual person at all. Now, people say like that Russian prostitute told me that night, ah, oh, don't give me that Jesus stuff, I'm not into religion. But you see, there's a difference between personal spirituality, that is personal relationship with Jesus, and religion. And that's why I said I'm not a particularly religious bloke. You know, go do the rituals, do this, do that, and I'm good. No, no, you're not good if you do that. It is faith in Jesus. And this relationship, as he starts off by saying, arm yourselves with the mind of the Lord Jesus, how you think. Who you are when nobody is looking, that is the essence. And he says, in regard to these, verse 4, they think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation. And so they speak evil of you, you who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the living and the dead. So he says, yeah, uh, people will 
think it's strange that you don't do what they do. But they don't realise that you and me, we have to give an account to the Lord Jesus, he that is ready to judge the living and the dead. That's the difference between you and me, that like it or not, we have been called. We have heard the gospel. We are responsible to God. And therefore, I will give an account. So I'm not going to do what you guys can freely go and do here in Croydon of an evening in Croydon or ever because Jesus died for me. And that's why he says, that he died for you so that, verse 2, so that you should no longer live the rest of your life in the flesh, but to the will of God. And because I will give an account. Now what that means is that at the day of judgment, it's not just going to be some automatic box ticking process. Oh, Duncan, uh, yeah, you're a believer, yeah, you've got a tick, you're good, yeah, your name's on the list, mate, you, you're good. There will be a discussion. And there's a lot of information in the Bible about judgment. That the Lord will say, for example, when I was hungry, well done, you fed me. And we'll be like, huh, when did I do that? Or when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. Huh, when did I not feed you? Yeah? So there's going to be some element of discussion. And when I was younger, I used to wonder how that could happen if there's millions and billions of people are going to come to Jesus at the day of judgment. Like, are we all going to line up? How long is it going to take? Is it going to take an hour? Two hours? A day? A month? For him to talk with me about all my life. And is there going to be a bloke waiting behind me? And behind me? How is that going to work? And likewise, you start to get into all these logistical problems. Well, where is it going to be? Where, you know, there's going to be millions of us waiting somewhere. And uh, in the church of my youth, they had this very bizarre idea that this judgment would be in Sinai, which is apparently the, the only place big enough to fit everybody in. Well, I don't quite get that, but anyway. And that the sisters in the church would be putting on tea and snacks for everybody, which is like sort of laughable, man. But the, the question still remains. How are, we, how are we all going to fit in? And, uh, you know, is it going to be half an hour each? An hour each? It's going to be a very long line. And uh, poor blokes are at the end of the queue. Is it going to be from A to Z? You know? How's it going to go? I suggest this, that when the Lord Jesus comes back, the meaning of time will be changed. Don't forget God is outside of time as we know it. And yeah, it will take as long as it's needed. It may feel like hours and hours, or maybe more. Going through your life, you've got to give an account. You know, that Friday night, Duncan, you said this, or you swore that, Tony, or you, you didn't do that, or, uh, but, yeah, but then on Saturday morning, you did this, well done, you know? Well, if there's gonna be that going through of my life, your life, it's gonna take a very long time. Especially with Spyro. <laughs> yes. I don't want to be behind you. Long <laughs> way. So, my suggestion is the whole thing will happen in a, a nanosecond, in a microsecond of time as we know it. And yet, likewise, it will be a legitimate real time going through of all our deeds. And just as a takeaway, a free possible takeaway, <laughs> If Einstein and relativity got it wrong, if you collapse the meaning of one dimension, you collapse the other. So if you collapse the meaning of time, you collapse the meaning of distance, as I understand it. So the old, distance, the old thing about how long is it going to take, no, it's all collapsed, it's all in a, in a nanosecond of time as we know it. Same issue, the, the logistics of well, how we're all going to fit in, no problem. Distance won't be the item, that's just a takeaway. So anyway, we will give account to the Jesus who is ready to judge the living and the dead. What that means is that when the Lord comes, there will be those whom Paul says will be alive and remain. And there will be others who have died who will be resurrected to judgment. And so he says, verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. And he's just said in verse 5 that Jesus is ready to judge the living and the dead. And you think, well, he was writing this getting on 2,000 years ago. How is it that Jesus didn't come when he was clearly expecting the coming of Jesus? 
Did they get it wrong? I don't think so. I think that the coming of Jesus is not a calendar date. God has not ringed a day on a calendar and said, right, 6th of June, 2035, at 3.12 p.m. Jerusalem time, Jesus is going to come back. I don't think so. He has set conditions. For example, when there's fruit on the fig tree, when the Jewish people repent, when the gospel goes into all the world, as the Lord said, then shall the end come. When the fruit is there, it's harvested. And yet, we are to live in expectation of the Lord's coming. And that's why Paul and Peter write as if Jesus is about to come. Well, he is. And also, again, it comes back to time perspective. If Jesus doesn't come for another 5,000 years, in the perspective of eternity, of infinite time, you and me living forever, what's 5,000 years? That's nothing. That's just a, a moment. In that sense, his coming is near. And we are to live like they lived on the evening of the Passover, ready to go, ready to, ready to leave. So in other words, to have a loose hold on all the things of this life. You know, if Jesus comes, I'll just be so happy to go. I don't want to go home first and take my, you know, 20,000 quid Rolex watch with me. I don't have one, but let's say I did. Um, no, oh, great, Jesus is back. I'm going to go now, straight away. Oh, yeah, don't hang around. No way. And so that's how we should live, that we are ready and eager to go. Verse 10. According, oh, sorry, verse 8. Above all things, being covered in your love among yourselves, for love covers a multitude of sins. I don't think that means that if I show love, that covers all my sins. I can go out and do a load of sins, but then I could come here and be very loving to you, lend you 10 quid, buy you some food, be kind and nice to you. Oh, great, that covers, that covers the last three days of sin. No, I don't think that's what he means. He's repeating, actually, the teaching in, in James, the letter of James, where he says that if you pray for each other, you can actually get forgiveness for the other person's sins. So, I think that's what he means, that your love among yourselves, that is your love for each other, will cover a multitude of sins. And straight away, even if you think you are the most insignificant person, you are not. Because by praying for another person, you can actually bring about their forgiveness. Now, I do not mean that you look out the window onto the high street here of Croydon and say, oh, oh, God, save that random bloke walking down the street. Maybe he doesn't want to be saved. But when it comes to people like you and me, we who are believers, but our problem is that we're weak. Well, you know, maybe God expects me to move from here to here, but I have only moved from here to here, and there's a gap between where I've got to and where I, I want to get to, where I need to get to. It's that gap, I suggest, that we can make up for each other by prayer. And that gives you huge significance that I can actually, you can actually help someone to come to eternal life who would not otherwise get there. Wow, you suddenly are very significant. And so he says, verse 10, according as each has received a gift, Minister it among yourselves as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. So he's saying that we have each of us received a gift. In the same way as when you're baptised into the body of the Lord Jesus, you have a role. You may be the finger, you may be the thumb, the eye, whatever, toe, whatever. We have each been given something. And there's people who think that I am nothing, I'm useless, I have got no talent, I've got nothing at all. But actually, when you are baptised into the Lord Jesus, you receive something. You receive a gift. You have a role in the body of the Lord Jesus. And in sort of high church, be it Catholics or Church of England, there is this idea that, yeah, ministry is done by the ministers, and the rest of us poor folks just come and sit there in the church and then you leave and you come back the next week and go through the same. There's the same in 
hardcore Pentecostalism, that the leaders are the leaders and the rest of you just come to give money and then go home. You know? No, we have each received a gift which we are to minister. Uh, and to minister means to serve. It doesn't mean to lord it over someone, it means to serve. So all of us are to be ministers. We, are all, we all have got a role to play. And that is what elevates all of us, that you may feel that oh, I'm useless, I'm nothing, I've got no ability, I have no talent, I, I'm just nothing. No, you are given a work to do for him. And, we, and that is a unique role. Just as Paul says, we are all part of the body of Christ, and we've all got a unique part to play within that body. <clears throat> so, all this is possible because the Lord Jesus died. All this is possible because he died. So that we might become part of his body. And as I look back to what I said at the start, <clears throat> as Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. So this is why we keep on breaking bread. We keep on bringing ourselves back to his body and to his life given for us. So that we might have his mind. The mind that he had there that we might keep on thinking about him. That he becomes central to our whole experience. And when you take this bread and this cup in a very small, tiny way, this very small piece of bread becomes a very small part of you. And this very small bit of juice becomes part of you. And so, in the same way, he becomes part of us. And we become part of him. So, let's... Um, Think about that. And if you have not yet been baptised into the Lord Jesus, I beg you to be baptised into his body so that you might receive his spirit. And, you know, come back to our place afterwards, get baptised, and I'll run you back to uh, Croydon afterwards. That's a promise. Like so many of you have already done that. Go for it, is what I would say. So let's, uh, let's just give thanks for the bread and the cup. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and for this cup in which we see the symbols of the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus. And we pray that you will go with each and every one of us and the, the mind of your son might truly live in our hearts, that his heart might be our heart and his spirit might be our spirit now and forevermore. Amen.